Hello. Ah, can you hear me? Hello. Hi, Nimesh. Ah, hi. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Okay, I was having some problem in logging in for some reason. Maybe we'll figure it out. Yeah. How are you doing here today? I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's get started. Yesterday, I think we spoke about some data types. Okay. Declarations, and we learned a little bit about the arrays and structures. Okay. All right. So we'll extend that example uh, from structures to let's get into understanding a little bit more about in you know, unions, and then we will talk about functions as well today. Okay. Okay. So largely we'll try to cover as uh, all these examples. Mm. For my I, I didn't get a chance Sorry. to go through. Uh, it was a big day today, so. Yeah, I know. You know, after uh, yeah. the professional, you know, people. Yeah. I don't know if you have realized this or not. Mm -hmm. The more we start, you know, contributing to the project and the work, yeah, we start becoming a single point of failure for the organization. <laughs> so it looks like you know if I'm not there in the project, how will the project run? And virtually, you know, every company is facing this problem. That how do we decouple this challenge? You know. True. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So I definitely understand what 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 are your <laughs> your challenges you must be coming across. It's difficult, you know, and you know, like. Even to explain your subordinates that the kind of thing which you're going through, if somebody can come and take over also. Yeah. Transition is not so easy that what you have been doing, you know? Yeah, exactly. That style, the way you interact with the client and the teammates and the people, yeah. it is completely different. Everybody has a different style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm off track a bit. But this is the reason why, you know, I started this EH Technologies to have a vision of creating better people. Because I found this, you know, this, this, this problem is so persistent. The whole world is trying to create a copy or a clone of him so yeah. that, you know, his uh, stuff can be very well managed by somebody else finally. It's not working, but, you know, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, true. <laughs> and probably, you know, it will continue. All right. So I think uh, uh, I will just refresh you uh, once again that we spoke about some arrays and we spoke about some uh, structures. structures, right? Mm -hmm. And we actually took some example about padding and packing and other stuff. Right. right? Yeah. We learned about pragma and then we learned about attribute style, you know, so singling out certain structures. Before that, we also spoke about array declaration styles, calling. We also learned about different way of initializing the structures, right? So yeah. aggregate initializers versus, you know, the dotted way of, you know, random initializations. So I can handpick some elements and I can initialize and leave others uninitialized, you know? Yes. And also manual assignment. We also spoke a little bit on, uh, uh, that assignment aspects of the array, which may not be possible, right? So, 
Yes. yes. Some of the pros and cons from the array. Yes. Yeah. But let's add something more here, you know, because you, you can see that you have created a lot of uh, uh, structure variables. You can also do an array of uh, structure. So I can say something like person and I can say, okay, uh, maybe employees database. And I can give some size, say, some 10. So now you have got some, you know, an array of uh, uh, person. So we can have a record stored, something like a 10 record stored. And it could be initialized again in the same way. So you know, first you opening and closing, and then we can have some initializations like this, you know? Uh, you got that, right? Yeah. Something like this. So syntactically just wanted to be aware make you aware about this. I can pick some and paste here. I can remove some part here. So, you know, and uh, yeah. Just give me an example. So, you know, uh, and, um, uh, okay, I, I don't know your birthday, so just pardon me, I'm just kidding something. 77. <laughs> okay. So. You're, you're Jan born, July born, I don't know. Jan born, John born. End of Jan. End of Jan. <laughs> End of Jan. You're close. Yeah. I am very close, not bad. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, place is 30, 31st, or how? 31st, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, see, I, I, I hit you, I hit you almost. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, now you see that you tell me how do we, you know, uh, 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 print you. So, can you? No, how do I print all this? So, yeah. So I got three elements. Rest all of them will zero. So how do I print all of them? Give me the code for it. Um, I, you know, I want to have these three database to be printed. So how should I approach it? All the three. A for loop. Um, okay. Sure. I'll go for for loop because you know there are only ten records. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and it becomes so much easier. So yeah, I'll I'll do a for okay. So should I declare the variable? So I'll say for i assign zero i less than what? I less than something? Yeah, three. Three, okay, plus plus i, and then, yeah, in i, yeah. What should be my next? Uh, print um, the okay. employee data. So I need to think that it's a string, right? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mod s, and then what? Then is mod D, which is my day of the month, right? Yes. Maybe more formatting like name is this. And let's go. How do I print the name now? Um, EMP, my array element, right? So EMP. And score database. Um, of I? Of I, yeah. Dot. Um, the structure name. So I need to know okay. the name of the structure. Variable name is what? Yes. Person's name. So I'll have to use dot person's name. Got it? Mm, yes. That makes sense. Okay. Good. How about the another? Because now we have more than one line. I'll just put a this one. Yeah. Okay, 
we'll go for date of birth so i'll say d o b and then we say like mod d slash mod s i'm just formatting them okay and then mod d so that it comes slash will come as if uh, it was a day format you know one of the format possible format okay and then slash in okay so now i will do again the same thing mm -hmm. employee database of i dot um. d o b correct and dot day yeah. don't you think so yeah but uh, yeah. d o b is um uh, nested structure, correct? Yes, yes, yes. So I have to say outer structure dot inner structure and then dot uh, the actual member name, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I think that makes sense. Yeah. Let's talk the, I think we will just print this three and just leave it as it is so that you can carry on to complete this later. All these examples are on a drive, so the moment it syncs, it is available for you, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, DOB, I'll just uh, print the okay, let me finish one of them, okay, EMP underscore database of okay, I dot sorry, yeah, DOB dot month. And I'll say again, EMP database of I dot DOB dot day to a year. Yeah. yeah. Let's just try print this and see. So there are some errors. Let's try to figure this out. So can we find where is the error? It's a semicolon. Line number. How do I see the error? Yeah. I see line number 52. Go to 40th column. So I come here, say colon 52. So I'm directly in this line number. So I'll go to the 40th column. Correct? So this semicolon is wrong. It should be a comma. Uh, okay. Right? See. And then let's try to rebuild this and see. Some more errors coming up. This is error in syntax. Uh, yeah, 40. So, yeah, so now it's again at line number 54. It's expecting one more. Here, this is actually correct because I should be the first member of an array. So this is zero. I mean, for the 77, 1977, there is a... Yeah, yeah you got that. Yeah. Good catch. So that's correct. Yeah, then let's try that. Now we have something more coming up. It could have... Yeah, so let's see. It says that plus plus i okay okay here is one more error so it's expected identifier before the token line number 53 can you give me somewhere we are doing some more error oh, more of lower bracket is missing um, 50 54 54, let me come here. Um, that looks to be correct, right? Yeah. Here is an extra. Uh, I mean, there is an extra one, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good, at least we're able, I mean, just, these are some places to see the errors. Yeah, right. Yeah. So as expected, mm -hmm. the results are there, yeah. okay? Yeah. Now we'll talk about something more powerful, okay? So concept from structures. So I think array of structure is understood and it's the same thing. Yeah. And becomes more powerful, right? Yes. Talk to a very interesting aspect of programming is unions in C programming. Okay. Okay. 
So this is something you must master. Okay. You know, from the perspective of, uh, so you must have come across some kernels, right? Yeah. In real time. Yes. So there are two kinds of kernel. One is a preemptive kernel and another is a non-preemptive kernel. Okay. Uh, are you aware about the difference between them? No. Okay. So then uh, let me explain you by something like this. That there is a concept called as, you know, uh, parallel processing. Okay. And there is a concept called as sequential processing. Are you aware about this? I mean, in a generic term, yes. I mean, yeah. So what does a sequential uh, programming do is? Kind of serial programming. I'm yeah. Serial. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's like, you know, you can think of a non-preemptive kernel. Okay. As a single or a sequential execution program. It means the moment a program starts running mm -hmm. and if I have 15 instruction, okay. Mm -hmm. So unless and until the first instruction is finished, there is no way the second instruction can be executed. Okay. Unlike if you say non-preemptive coding or a parallel programming, mm -hmm. then you might have a 15 lines of a code in your program but it is possible that one of the instruction can be while executing on one of the CPU, it's possible that the another instruction can also be executed, you know? Okay. So it is possible even on a single, you know, CPU, it is possible by achieving pipelining technique, you know, and give you a feeling of that there is a parallel processing going on, but actual execution is sequential only. Okay. okay. If you have more than one processor, then the program runs. It can be made to spin in a multi-threading environment. You know, okay. that's what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a C program, right? When you design on 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 top of uh, PDP seven, it was a Unix, which was an outcome of C program. If you see, so the operating system Multix was not good, and then you know you wanted to write a new language so that you can have a very robust operating system design and developed. So Unix was an outcome of how the C programming, you know, eventually got evolved along with it. And they gave you the Unix operating system in this world. Okay. And while they did that, hardware were not so competent with multiple hardwares or multiple CPUs, you know. Those days were like, you know, microcontroller with, you know, or processor with 10 megahertz, one megahertz, 15 megahertz, and that were like a great PCs, you know? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at C programming by default structure also, it is sequential in nature. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, so uh, by default, it cannot have parallel processing. So, it's, so what we do is we take help of multi-threaded libraries or some third party, you know, extensions from the vendors by which part of my program can execute in parallel. Okay. And union was designed, okay, not looking into this parallel execution in mind. Okay, union was an example of a shared memory concept. Okay, okay. because in embedded applications, there were scenarios where memories was a huge constraint. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the same hardware could represent differently the same location. For example, a 632 bit register could be represented as two different 16 bit registers. Okay. However, when you combine them together, they refer to the same physical location, what it refers to a 32 bit location. You understand that? Okay. Yeah. So what I mean by this is suppose if you have a re hardware register, which is a 32 bit register. Okay, let's name it as say R0. Mm -hmm. So R0 is right now what? A 32 bit register. Yeah. Now, <laughs> this 32 bit registers can be made as R0 16 and R0 31. So, yeah. Or R0 to 15 or R0 lower and R0 higher, for example. Yeah. So R0 lower refers to the 16 bit and R0 higher refers to the 16th or the 31st bit, you know? something like this. But when you write the data on that, it both refers to actually one physical 
register R0. You get that? Yes. Yes. It cannot be achieved unless until we had a mechanism at, in the language. And that's the purpose of union, you know, altogether. So union is uh, a data structure which allows you to provide a shared memory location across different data types. Okay. Okay. It means it, and by doing this, it has to, you know, entertain all the data types. So what it does, it takes the highest data type among all the declaration a user has made and just allocates the memory for that rather than inclusively allocating the memory. Now, just to show you this, I can say something like I have a union device and here I can say something like int a byte char okay char could have been a byte and int could be a word and I could also have a double say d word and then I could also have okay first you guess this so what do you think should be the size of this uh, union? Think. Um, int is four, uh, character is one, five, double is um, two. Say eight bytes. Eight bytes, okay. Integer is four bytes and character is one byte. Yeah. So if you go by the math, it should be like I should allocate what? Eight plus four plus one, which is 13 bytes. Yes. Yeah, but union won't do that. That's the job of structure. The union will say that, hey, it's a memory concept. It's an example of what? Shared memory. So it will take the highest data type among all these three. Mm -hmm. And it will say what? Double looks to be using an eight byte of memory. Okay. okay. So what I do is I, you know, will allocate the memory for the double only. So only the memory for double V. So there's only one memory location called as eight bytes. Now the same eight bytes can be either at some point of time be represented as what? A double word. Or it could also be used as a word. Or it could be also used as a byte. Which is fair enough in a non-preemptive program. Non-preemptive in the sense when the programs will run sequentially. Yeah. It means while I'm using a double data or a register, it is absolutely sure that the next instruction will not execute, correct? Correct. Yes. So it's okay. It's fair enough. But what is the advantage we are using? In a memory constraint environment, same memory location, I can be used for multiple data type and I can play around. Oh, okay. So logically, it is a very powerful mechanism at a high level line. You getting me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Let's try to quickly print the size of this guy. So the size of union device is mod D and we are going to say size of uh, device. And you know, I will remove this uh, uh, struct device here because it can complain. One way you are saying it's a struct, another way you're writing a definition, a union, and I'll make this as a type def. So type def union device device. Okay. Okay. And let's try middle this. You can see the result is eight. Eight bytes. Very clearly. So what does it say? It says that. Now let's try to access. So how do you do that is, of course, I can say, uh, say some device, eval device. And, you know, I can say uh, initialization also, I can do this. But you know, the results will be undefined. 4.45 and then I'll say a word say zero cross FF and then I'm gonna say A. Okay. So because you are initializing all the three, you know, yeah. behavior is undefined here because see, if I say printf, mm -hmm. 
eval. Okay, I'll just use mod D or LF. L is to, LF stands for long float, okay? okay? Which is to print a double. Okay. And then you would say, same, you can access as if it was a structure. So all the syntax remains the same, only the memory location. Okay. This is also people will ask you what is the you know, difference between uh, structure and union. Okay. So you can say that, you know, you can structure is the one which takes the memory for all the elements which you have declared. Mm -hmm. And union takes the highest data type, you know, in a, uh, to allocate the memory. Okay. For example, you know, you can give an example. For example, if we have three different data types like this, mm -hmm. the size of it will be something like this. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So well dev dot C or print D word. So you know, because it the initialization has been done for all the three, and if you want to have an access, you can see here. Access elements in union initializer. Union should only initialize any one at a time. It's not a struct. So that's why it's a warning. So how we should do is have one initialization. Say I can either I could have done only for one. I'm just trying to show you a legal way of using it. Okay. It's the word, uh, and then it should be assigned to say, you know, twelve point four. This is fair enough. Assign it temporarily and use it right now. No worries. Out. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 That's fine. And it is expected. Hey, tomorrow if you want to use uh, the another element, use it. For example, word, and you make it as uh, say zero cross ff. Four nine five. And then I'm gonna use a word is and because word is a D, I can print that in hex, by the way. By saying mod X is a hex number, okay? okay. So if you're printing an in integer, can you see that? FFF being printed in it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But so, uh, I mean, it's not reading from the... It's in the same memory location. You know? Only one location, right? Now, the interesting thing will be, what about the D word at this moment? While we have overwritten, you can see the behavior of it is completely undetermined. Okay. So I cannot guess that, hey, 12 is still retaining or something. No way. It can be corrupted. Okay. So imagine that tomorrow if I say, well, uh, word, okay. Well, dev dot okay, I'm running on low battery. Well, dot dot, I would say byte. And here, if I say, say capital A, and after this, I want to perform these you know prints over here. So I can say. The byte is, I can say mod C, and I can change this to be a byte. And let's try this on top. You can see A, and now it has changed. F41, you know, it's overwriting. 41 is in hex 65. Yeah. It's wrong that memory, you know? So something really strange, but the idea is what? It is expected that while you are using a character, you will not be trying to access what? Double. Oh, okay. Okay. So the whole idea is, you know, how you can accumulate and, you know, treat the same memory as a three different, you know, logical separation of the same memory location. I can also treat as if it is, you know, a set of entire array, you know, okay. so total array of eight bytes also tomorrow. 
So just to now check your, uh, you know, some analogy over it, I will try to change the declaration and you give me the size. now. Let's see if you have got this. Okay. So what I do is I come to line number six and I would say, uh, character of, I'm saying bytes of eight. So what is the size of the union? Um, Just think. The care, care, care bytes is an array, right? Character yeah. is one byte. Yeah, so byte of eight, it's going to be eight, eight bytes. So okay. Double. So double is also eight bytes. So what should be the size of the union? The max is eight, so it can be. Eight. Eight, eight, eight bytes. Yeah. Perfectly correct. Okay. What if I say something like 16? So. What will be the guess? Now I have made it as um, 16 here bytes. So it, can it go up to 16, 16? It should go to 16 because it's an array of six bytes. Yeah. An array of 16 bytes means it should be contiguous in memory, isn't it? Yes. So because of contiguity, it needs 16 bits. 16. Yeah, so because 16 bytes can accommodate, the whole idea is take the highest data type, which is possible to accommodate everybody, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I think you got that. Yeah. Okay. Only the thing which you have to remember is that accessing is completely undefined. If you want to simultaneously access it. Now, what I mean by this, mm -hmm. suppose if this line, and if this line, line number 16, line number 17, 18, all these lines were running in parallel, like a thread, you know? Okay. Then there is a race condition, correct? Yes. Because the same shared memory is being used by yeah. Different lines or different threads in a simultaneous program. Mm -hmm. yeah. So always you be careful when you use a union in a non preemptive environment or a process based environment, right? If a program is running sequentially, it is fine. Okay. If it is running in a multi threaded application environment, everybody must take care of the race condition. So you can apply those semaphore or, you know, mutex and then you can ensure that it is guarded across. So while you are using it, you know, somebody else will be denied. They will be waiting for it. Once you free it, you will acknowledge that, hey, I'm free with this. Now you can come and make use of it, you know? Okay. Okay. So some basic, you know, IPC mechanism, inter-process communication mechanism. Mm -hmm. One of the simplest mechanism to control the race condition is using a mutex or a semaphore. It's like, you know, lock the scenario. I use the work, do the work, and then unlock that scenario, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that clear? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So no, another. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. You have any questions? You can. Ask. So the semaphore um, or mutex that you mentioned. I mean, hmm. um, it. Who controls that? I mean, who runs uh, that? It's going to be. Um, it's a, main, see, it's it's the system. It's the kernel. It's the OS which runs. It's not yeah. Okay. Understand. Yeah. Yeah. So they will specify some APIs and all. For example, if you wanted to use a POSIX semaphore. You have something like P thread, or you can also think of sem underscore open. So you know you can initialize an open named semaphore. You can have APIs like sem wait, so it does work. It locks the semaphore pointed by a sem, right? And similarly, you have functions like post by which you release or unlock the semaphore, you know? Okay. So, you know, programmatically what we could do is declare the same for. And while we are doing this assignment job, I will lock before this, unlock before this, lock before this, unlock before this. Okay. So I ensure that while this line is being run, no other threads can disturb it, you know, okay. something like that.
I hope that answers you. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right. Now I will add something more about this. There is a concept called as variance in Unix. Uh, sorry, in C with union. So variant in the sense the same memory location being used differently. Okay. Now to take this example, let's take a very classic old uh, microprocessor architecture. I think in your uh, academics, you must have gone through this, but it's a classic example. It will easily help you understand it. Okay. Uh, you must be aware about 8086 or 8085 kind of architecture. Yes, yes, long back though. Long, long back though, okay. So let's uh, try refresh. If you look at uh, an x86, uh, 8086, uh, 5, you know, GPR, general purpose register. Okay. Mm -hmm. It usually contains 16 bit of registers. So 16 bit can be represented by something like short and unsigned short. When I say unsigned means by default, all the data types when you declare are signed, it means it can take negative and positive. When I say unsigned, it only accepts positive values. Okay. okay. Yep. So, yeah. So the size of uh, uh, a normal character is uh, eight bits when it is unsigned. And if it is signed like this in line number six, it's seven bits. One bit is used for, you know, finding out whether you are negative or positive. Okay. Yeah, so short is a perfect uh, data type which guarantees that 16 bits will be allocated for. Now what we can do here is AX, BX, CX, and DX, correct? Yes. Yeah. Now the same data structure, okay, in the 8086 provides uh, another way of accessing the same memory location called as AL, UEL, AL, AH. Means A, accumulator lower, accumulator higher. Okay, B register lower, B register higher. Similarly, C register lower and C register higher. D register lower and D register higher. Right? ALAH, BLBH, CLCH, DLDH, yes. you know, this kind of register. And if you combine AL and AH, which are eight bits each, so one byte each, so these two combined together is as good as referring AX. AX. Now, how do I, you know, combine both of them? So that they refer to the same memory location. So I can say something like a union. 86 and here we can bring in struct GPR say word and here we can say struct X GPR so I need to make it as two different names because both refers to same. So I'll say W and I will say B. So same thing I'll suffix here, W and I'll see B. And here I'll say byte. Correct? Yeah. So now see, suddenly you have, uh, and then I'm going to say this as on okay, type def, Union x86 x86. Now it becomes a new data type for me. Correct? Um, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, type def union is an x86 and then x86. x86 becomes a new a union data type. Okay. Right? And now I'll say, you know, void demo variant and here I'll use x86 and then I'll say GPR register 
GPR becomes a variable of x86 union. So now can you think of what will be the size of a, the union? How much memory will the union allocate? So let's guess that quick. I mean, it, it's one, one, one. Short means two bytes and character means one bytes. So it's one, two, three, four, right? So it's four. Four into two is what? Eight bytes. Eight bytes, okay. Yeah. And here also it's like each of them is a byte. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Bytes. So overall, what should be? This is also eight and this is also eight. So what's the size of union? Eight. Eight byte. Yeah. So yeah. same memory location, but variant access it meant we can access it differently like gpr dot word dot ax right that's one of the way to access the word register okay or gpr dot byte dot al correct yes gpr dot byte dot al getting mm -hmm. And I'll say zero cross FF. GPR dot byte dot AH. That also can take eight bit, I'll say FF. Probably now you have to tell me, but I'll be printing F the data in AX is equal to mod D in hex mod x correct mm -hmm. so i'll be printing now how do i print in word gpr dot word dot ax same thing again gpr dot word dot ax so one will be printing in a decimal value one will be printed in a hex value Okay, the problem here is I've written this function, but I haven't called them inside the main. So the function definition is written at line number 28. Pardon, we haven't called them. So now what I do is I comment this function, demo union, and I'll call the demo, demo variant. Makes sense. All right. Then now let's go this. As expected, what happened? Yeah, the, um, the decimal and hex uh... it refers to the same. What's very interesting is when you write to the lower and the higher half, and when you print in AX, AX has got both the lower and the higher half, isn't it? FFFF. -F -F -F. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's a very powerful concept. You got that. Yeah. It's like through a C program, I'm directly accessing in a hardware, okay. right? Yeah. To, to, through byte or through word, right? Mm -hmm. So if I make this as a E, so the result should be, it's higher. So F, 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 E. There you go. Now, why does it come as F E F F? Can you think of? Um. And the Intel machine has this byte ordering problem. Little Indian to a beginning. Yeah, yeah little Indian. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. So it's because of L E. So when I say H, it's on the lower end side, yeah. correct? Yeah. And that is why you are seeing F E and F H. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Now for this, you can also plan something more interesting, you know, like how do you know the endiness of an application? How do you know the endiness of an application? So whether it's a big Indian or a little Indian. Little Indian. So union with a variant provides this fantastic, you know, 
access to you. We can do that. Okay. So I'll just write it here on top. Or maybe near to the main so that we can browse together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will remove this and paste it here itself. If, okay, I don't need this. So let's consider NDNS. How do I test that is, I will take a long data mm -hmm. and then I'll take an integer, well, not integer, the character. So I can say an unsigned long integer and I can say an unsigned character byte of zero. So here instead of zero, I'll say four. Why? Because long is also four bytes and character is also four bytes. Four bytes yes. yeah. And notice what I do is it's a trick that I can use NDNS, which is in this case, I'm not using a type diff. I, then I have to mention union Indian. And, and then I'm going to say, and then dot data is equal to zero cross one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Okay. 32 bit data. But while printing, what I do is I say, See, I'll format that. I'll say uh, zero. So I'll say byte of zero is equal to mod hex. And what should be the print? I'll just say and then dot what byte of zero. Correct? So I'll come to know in the zeroth byte, which is stored, whether it is zero one stored or seven eight stored. Oh, okay, okay. Right. It's a very easy way to figure this out. Yeah. And this technique can be used for converting a big Indian to a little Indian, you know, sometimes you require to mm -hmm. convert okay. a program. So you, you can you know, think of this kind of union as a very interesting logic. Yeah. So uh, three. And now let's try this. Wow, isn't it? So the byte zero itself stores what? Seven, eight. So yeah. MSB is there in the LSB. Is it not clear? Yes, yes. Yeah. So if I had a big Indian like power PC or something, I would have got byte zero is equal to one, two. Correct, yeah. Now suppose if I give you an assignment that, hey, can you do something like this? Uh, convert a big Indian to a little Indian, correct? Yeah. So I think if you can apply a swapping logic, okay. take a temporary and you can shift the one, two into byte of zero, three, four into byte one, right? Yeah. Five, six comes back to byte two and seven, it comes back to byte three. Mm -hmm. Done, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes this is one. Sometimes this is also a technique via which you can access certain bytes of a word or data. So suppose if I have a long, if I have a four byte of a data and somebody wants you to access the third byte of a data, what you could do? You could just wrap that inside a union and access it. Okay. Right, it refers to the same memory location, but in byte order, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So think of tomorrow you have a hundred byte of data or 200 bytes of data or one meg of data. I can say unsigned long of that whatever 128 byte of data is there, correct? Yeah. And then I can say a byte of some 128. So each of that 128 byte block will be uh, slit into a byte, correct? Yes. 
and I can start using an embedded access. It's a very powerful way by which a variant concept is used in embedded applications. Okay, so use union very carefully when you are writing what a multi-threaded application. Otherwise, you can enjoy the union at the max, correct? Because you do not have any race conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the note to take from the union from the program. Okay. Now there is one more concept which I wanted to talk about related to this is bit fields. So are you aware about this? Bit fields? Yeah. You know, one of the very common question, hardware engineers ask to the high level programmers are, hey, I have a register which I want you to represent in bits. So how do you declare a bit in C? Byte is fine. But yeah. Is there any way to declare a bit in C? Is a concept where bit fields comes in picture. Okay. Bit fields is a very advanced version of bitwise operation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, are you aware about the bitwise operation? Um, I, I did spoke this as a slide, but not given you in any example. So see, bitwise operation talks about the way you manipulate a certain bit in a word. So hardware programmers sometimes need these kind of supports. And I wanted to show you them very quickly. So assume that I have a data whose value is say, 1010 zero, one, zero, or say 11 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay. And now, probably this may be not a very good idea. Okay, let me show you something like FF. Okay, something like this. And tomorrow, if I want to say, I want to have the complement, I want to flip this piece, once complement. So FFFF -F 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 refers to, can we think of? 1111. So my expectation is that it will be converted to 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 something like that. Flipping the bits. Yeah. In fact, there may be a lot of other zeros also because it's 32 bit environment. Okay. Correct? Yes. Uh, one byte, two byte, three byte. Hey, I, I think one, eight more bits. Yeah, I think now it's fine. So our expectation is it should become something like this. And these all should become what? One, 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 one. Yeah. yeah. So how do I do that? Is where once complement comes into picture. I can say print it mod hex and mod hex and slash. And then I can say data comma complement of the data. A tilde operator we use. Okay. <clears throat> We can see what happened. We got the result as expected. Yeah. So FF is flipped. So now the last has become zero, zero, zero. And these all will become one, one, one. Don't we agree? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just keep it for one example. I think then after that you can learn easily. I can just skip. Don't need to write this. Perfect. Cool. So it's an example of what? Flipping the bits of once complement. Right. In a hardware, you have this, and this is how you do in software. Now assume that you know you want to 
left shift a particular bit by one rotation of the bit. So this bit is going to be removed from here and it should go for it. A very good example we can think of. Now we'll change the data value to be say just two. So what should be the value of uh, two internally? Zero, zero, last nibble we will see, zero. one, zero. Uh, zero. Zero, one, zero, correct, yeah. Right. Yeah. So by left shifting, what's happening here is, this bit has to be left shifted once, right? Yes. So one, the actual power will change, right? Yeah, it will become four. Yeah, exactly. So how do I do that is by using a left shift operator. So I can do that by using printf. Uh, mod x or mod d and mod d slash so one is going to be data and another one is going to be data left shift by one so that's the you know two consecutive less than error followed by the number of times you want to rotate a bit so i just want to rotate the bits for only once. Okay. You see that? Yeah. You've yeah. doubled you. So naturally, you know, if I say something like a right shift, then I'll be using the greater than arrow. Okay. So I'll remove these and this by one. Yeah. So naturally, two divided by, so it should be coming out to be one, correct? Because you have left sh right shifted the value by one so it will be okay. as good as dividing by two and multiplying by two okay. i mean instead of using gating logic i mean this is more uh, exactly exactly instead of using gating logic what we used to do in hdl and other things yeah yeah don't need directly use it and then it performs so it helps right yeah it helps definitely. yeah yeah and then we have something more which is called as masking the bit and unmasking the bit mm -hmm. so masking the bit is like or exclusive or and then you have something like this right yeah. so we can think of uh, uh, one more data variable i mean we can take the example on this itself what is wrong there? Yeah. you can always say data is assigned to be zero cross ff you could easily guess it. Yeah. So, print. Uh, I can see the masking of bits. So, gated and logic you know, is only done by this. You know what is gated and it clears the bit. Okay. So mod D slash N. And then I can say press so data address one. So what does it mean? So this is my mask value, you know, zero cross one with the data which I'm trying to notice this is small ampersand, okay. If it is a double ampersand, it means it is a logical comparison. Mm -hmm. okay. And if it is a single ampersand, it is about a bit mask value. So right now data is FF, one is mass, so one and one is still one. Yeah. Now I'm going to change that to zero. And then we will see the impact of this. You can see what happened. Yeah. Zero is completely maxed, right? So all zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, right? Yeah, FF became zero. Yeah, that's fair enough, right? Yeah. yeah. There is something which we also can do and get it or value. It means I can retain the mask value without much by using just a single or statement. Okay. So this is a single or statement. So data. Or zero. So it will retain the value as it is, right? Yes. As you see? Yeah. Unchanged. Mm -hmm. And there is an exclusivity also.
which is uh, by using a power variable. So I'll use uh, shift and six for this, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is your caret. It looks like a power variable. This is an example of exclusive R, XR. XR, okay. So if both are lower means it is high. If it is both the high, it is a low. Is correct? Yeah, yeah. In this case also. Almost like an XR because we haven't given any value yet. Yes. Yeah. So these are some, you know, very interesting, uh, you know, bitwise manipulation. So what I can see here is by using this, we can shift the bit or manipulate the bit or in combination of all this, we can mask a bit or program the bit, correct? Yes. But yes. it's pretty cumbersome, you know, to plan what should be the mask value. Ultimately, it boils down to that calculator, you know, in your mind. Yes. That what is that mask value on this, which will fit very well or something. It's not a very convenient method of representing a register which is in bitwise, you know, uh, distribution. Yeah. And that is where bit fields comes in picture. Okay. So now let's look at how does it look like. I've got a bit field. Bit field is an example of an struct. Say we want to represent some number system, okay? I'll say number system, okay? Now we want to represent three number system. One is a, a binary number system. One is a octal number system, okay? And another one is a hex uh, system, right? Yeah. So to represent a binary, how many bits is required? Binary zero, one, so two bits. Only one bit. I mean, one bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that either it is zero or one, that's uh, sufficient, right? Yeah. For octal, we will be needing how many? Three bits. So, yes. Yeah, zero to seven, right? So three bits is sufficient. And for hex, I think we'll be needing four bits. So zero to 15, right? F, F, zero to, 15. Zero to F, right, 15. So, yeah. so four. four bits is sufficient. Yes. So if I were a normal structure, I can say the least what I could say is character, one for hex, okay? Mm -hmm. One character, which we could say what? for oct, correct? Yeah. And one we could say character binary. Correct? This is the maximum we could say. Now you tell me, if I find the size of the structure, what should it be? <clears throat> so three... Uh, three bits or maybe if it is padded, it will be four bytes. Four, yeah. But because all of them are in the character, maybe it can access it as if it is a three bytes. Let's look at this. Size. Oh. Number system. Let me you know, type div this. It comes easy. So, what is the editor uh, that you're using? Uh, I, I'm using VI, okay. Vim Editor. Okay. Vim Editor. What do you prefer using it? I mean, I usually use uh, VI. Uh, uh, I, mean, I didn't know that, uh, I mean, it has this, I mean, it gives uh, us... Uh, right? uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's amazing and powerful. Maybe, you know, I can give you some quick hints on that. Yeah. So when you say control N, you know, it automatically completes the overall feature. It's pretty fast. Yeah. Probably, you know, it's one of the most uh, powerful editor in the world. Everything is an, you know, outcome of uh, majorly a VI. All the UI stuff you see, you know, mm -hmm. auto test corrections and everything, you know, okay. it's out of VI only. Okay. Of course, it gives concentration to keyboard but very amazing features. Quick search, quick, quick replaces, multiple windows, navigating across source, 
Yeah, and also splitting the screen. I mean, yeah, split screen, view uh, splitting. And yeah, it's really cool yeah. stuff. And using across windows, like we can use Control W W to switch from one window to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, when we used to, I remember, uh, you know, twelve years back when I was uh, developing one of the code, mm -hmm. a very large source code base for uh, Saudi Telecom STC. Okay. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I had something like six different uh, large screen uh, windows. So I had six monitors on my desk and all of them were roughly having seven or eight windows of PIM split across. Because you know, there was, there were some uh, algorithms which were flowing from one source code to another. Okay. So I always used to have all those, you know, 83 windows aligned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody dares touch my monitor, it can only be switched off, it cannot be restarted the machine. Okay. So I come back in the morning and, you know, uh, I'll switch on all my monitors. Okay. And it's a, you know, it's easier, you know, in front of you to see, okay, from this code, now it is jumping to the, you know, 17th uh, source code, which is in the screen number 11. And then from there, it is going to the 15th screen, it's coming to the 53. Must but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It looks like, you know, you are a nerd there, but yeah. it really, if, if you are a nerd, it is, uh, so be it, right? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> I mean, it's easy, you know, we should learn these things. See, yes. if we have a very complex source code and mm -hmm. uh, if we cannot take the in entire source code print out, uh, earlier we used to see our seniors were so, you know, sincere. They take out the printout of the source code and put into the bullet charts, right? By using the pin boards. Right. And crazily analyzing by using the sketch pen and the highlighter from there, he connects it to the another page from there. He connects to the, he brings back the third, fifth page printout to the third page and he creates a dashboard and the, every day he comes in and he keeps figuring about this. How do we make change? on this? I mean, yeah. awesome guys, you know, yeah. we learn from them, but when we come back here, no, it becomes uh, messy. Yeah. Yeah, let me, sorry, I got, uh, yeah, 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 so I'll just say size of an S and I think off size of, yeah. You can see three bytes as expected. Yeah. But imagine if we can have this uh, modified as a bit fields. What if I could have one byte of allocation and I can split them across bits? Will be amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So that's why we do something like unsigned hex takes. Now you see this syntax. After the variable, I say colon and then say four. Again, I say unsigned, care, char, octal, how many bits we need? Three. And then I say unsigned, binary, and I say what? Colon, one. So the moment I say this, it, what it refers to is that there is one byte of memory being allocated, out of which binary means is an alias for one of those bits. Octal refer to the another three bits, which combines together make four bits, and another four for hex. So all together, how much? Eight bits, which is one byte. Yeah. Let's see that. Awesome. So, so this is how you could represent or split a particular eight bit as a register format or a 32 bit register for now. So can I ask you say, if I had a register say, uh, let's take any one register, you know, uh, from, from, from the world say, PSW register in S051.
so yeah so how many bits it is one two three four five six undefined seven right eight four four eight so how do i represent this in c software if i have to represent a psw for example if i remember these cya cf0 or any other i mean just i'm giving an example right yeah so tomorrow if i have a, another register say msw sorry in r or maybe psw programming status word in r psw yeah so now the status registers will explain me about you know all the different uh, format I'm, I'm not sure if they have given a diagram yeah. okay it has so you can see here it's like bit 0 to bit 7 cy scary auxiliary carry f0 rs1 rs0 bank selection overflow and so on so correct from an arm perspective it has given you one variance right yeah. something like this so if i were to you know address this how do i do pretty simple for you right just take a struct So struct, and I can say something like PSW. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Are they getting scared over here? They don't have a 911 here, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. You know, uh, you, you must be aware, right? I, mean, like, I am very much. Schools uh, to call. If there is any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. These guys are like fantastic, yeah. fantastic over uh, there, you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. Nice what to say, what not to say. And <laughs> I hope you guys have not served the, the in the park your time and all, right? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, no. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, I remember this incident. Again, can I take a couple of minutes? On a sure, sure. Okay, Morgan, he was an outstanding, you know, design engineer from, for Texas, from mm -hmm. NI, okay. Mm -hmm. He was my classmate. He is still in Houston. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he has a team. You, you know, there, is a, there was a, a very popular hardware architecture from, uh, uh, from TI, which, which, yeah. which, yeah. So, it was designed by him, you know, the... Oh, okay. Yeah, so the Beagle board. Oh, the Beagle board, yeah. I know. Yeah, so the, the Beagle was designed by this guy, Morgan, oh. internal team from TI. And he was also a contributor to OMAP series. I was a, I was a very old part of a, a Power Optimize DDR RAM, so PWSSP and XIP, oh. execute in place flash. So I designed that in 97, 96 oh. uh, as a hardware design. Mm -hmm. So this guy, you know, he stayed in the U.S. and while the kids were growing up, you know, mm -hmm. this guy had an, you know, he had a habit of controlling things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's inherited in us, you know. So yeah, all Indians do that. Yeah. <laughs> we do that, right? This guy has tried a lot there and, you know, mm -hmm. the neighbors has called <laughs> my 911. <laughs> this guy has been jacked completely over there. <laughs> and his his kids were immediately taken to the custody by the social security cats and then you know uh, uh, sec uh, security mainland uh, and they were given child child care exactly uh, and and you know like for six months they were without the kids and they were given a task that every you know uh, evening you got to go from five to six and four to five for both of them separate timings Okay. And hourly spend five hours of time with the kids in the park. <laughs> and uh, there is somebody who's going to come every week and going to review them. <laughs> and after, the, you know, after six months, they have cleared and they have sent the kids back. The kids are like, it's cool, you know, not to be at home. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and he wants to come back and the kid says now oh, not so difficult you know he's been yeah. there for more than 23 24 years he has a green card now okay he, yeah. he wanted to come back and the kid said okay dad you can go back we are <laughs> don't, don't, don't. Yeah, yeah we are anyway american so sure. you can enjoy your country yeah. back yeah i mean anyway. the, i've seen many instances like this i mean but at least i mean few cases uh, about indians i mean most of them like these americans i mean even fourth graders fifth graders they just call left and right i mean seriously, seriously. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's the difference, you know. In, yeah. in I mean, the way we we grew up. I mean, completely different. Yeah. My parents used to hit me and you know punish me. Of course, of <laughs> course, of course. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's we all, didn't. It's all uh, like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were really well beaten up. I mean, that's why we are so strong. I get sometimes we feel exactly. like that. You yeah. know. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, yeah, all right. Good. At least. the 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 kids have reminded me back <laughs> yeah. yeah so i was just trying to okay sorry let's come back so i was just trying to say you know if we had these variables uh, known to us like the cy and ac and fc also cy so carry mm-hmm. uh, and a0 or ao auxiliary carry again bit one so it it is you know and and i'll just say da 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 i mean just something like this say if you have a reserved stuff also you can say uh um uh, and sign and say the next uh, you know four bits are to be reserved so i'll say reserved bits and here i can say okay reserved don't program me Mm-hmm. and tomorrow when we want we can always enumerate them in the next version of the hardware if i want to use this particular bit maybe i can start using this bit right because my hardware would have complex and yeah. these bits might be used for something else as a representation isn't it? yes yeah. so this is a very interesting way of how hardware engineers mm-hmm. get a sigh of relief that hey in c we have this ability by which we can directly you know program the bits or represent the you know register bits the way we used to do in you know in our hdl code yeah so accessing only one limitation about this is that you cannot take the internal address of this so you cannot say scan f and then you want to take one bit address at the run time so i can't do address of say ns dot hexa this you cannot do you can take minimum one byte address but this will be a compile time cannot take address okay bits address at run time is not possible minimum a byte so anything you accept from a keyboard right mm-hmm. at least a byte has to be accepted okay yeah but the good thing is it can manage it for example if i say ns dot now let's look at this how do we access them only compile time ns dot binary it says that see if you are programming a register you know which bits yeah so mention them so binary i'll say one then i say ns dot octal was octal and then i say 7 is max right so i'll say 7 and uh, then i'll say ns dot hex I'll say hex and that will be say 15 right yeah and then i definitely want to print them so i will command this and i'll just say print it the data is in hex and what it could be uh, ns so you know ns is internally an byte or a character type yeah. it says of course you know Uh, the ns doesn't have an hex number it is an hexa octal and hexa i have to okay. type error yeah i don't really like it and now though it is uh, an warning error because you know it says that hey you are using a structure then how do you say that it is a hexa value internally we know it's a byte yeah yeah which we can cast and make it as it's a character or a hex okay but here we can see the value well printed 
Mm -hmm. I think I didn't give you a slash B, it's the backspace, it should be in the end. So there is an F being printed, if you notice, this one. F, F, correct? Yes. This 15 may be F, and this is the another F. So a total F, F, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, one, one, see, you know, the whole byte has to be represented. So can we think of how will my variable be represented? Last bit B will be one, correct? Okay, yeah. Then after that, you have written seven. Seven is equal to what? Three ones. Okay. One, one, one. In hex, correct? And then, yeah, okay. And then 15 means one, one, one. one. You got that? Okay, okay, got it. So altogether, yeah, it's, it's something like but it's stored in other way, you know, little Indian, right? So first one, 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 that is 50. And then the one, 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 and then one, correct? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So very neatly, you know, program. So prefer using bit fields over, you know, bitwise operations because, you know, bit fields is, gives you an easy way of interacting and touching the bit, correct? Correct, yes. Now imagine if you were left shifting a particular bit by two or touching or masking a particular bit mm -hmm. by using an value or, you know, planning. A uh, struct with a bit field would have been a very good choice, isn't it? Yeah. Because I can directly say ns dot or bit dot whatever I want, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this all together completes the concept of all the data declaration styles about structure, unions, bit fields, also about the arrays and some very basic data types like enumerations and basic integer characters and others. So I think most of the data type is uh, covered to you yeah. okay okay so it brings to the end of looping it brings to the end of data declaration and data type okay. uses okay sure. what we'll do here is take a five minutes break okay, okay. and then come back and discuss about function okay in c okay yeah. you, you're good to go right uh yeah 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 we'll take it five maybe minutes. we'll take a five minutes break yeah and then come off for at least some half an hour more Right? For sure. Definitely. All right, then I'll be muting and then back. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.